Welcome to the SIF 45 Streams Roundtable Series. I am Patrick Shepard, the Associate Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival. We want to give special thanks to PNC for sponsoring our Filmmaker Conversations content throughout the festival. On today's Roundtable episode, we'll be joined by the filmmakers from the feature films Cured, Swan Song, and Yes, I Am, the Rick Wyland story. Each of these films is part of uh, are part of our Dreamcatcher program, which highlights films uh, with LGBTQ plus themes made by LGBTQ plus directors. In addition to talking about each of these three films in depth today, we're going to touch base on what it's like for LGBTQ plus filmmakers in today's independent film industry. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the filmmakers from the documentary documentary Cured. Uh, director, uh, directors, producers, and writers, Patrick Salmon and Bennett Singer. The filmmakers from the documentary, Yes, I Am, The Rick Weiland Story, director, producer, Aaron Baer, associate producer, Andy Volk. And the filmmaker behind the three films, Swan Song, Gypsy 83, and Edge of 17, all playing in SIF 45 streams, and our Dreamcatcher Award recipient this year, Todd Stevens. So let's get started. All right, Patrick and Bennett, Cured. This is one of the most thoughtful and comprehensive documentaries about the history of the LGBTQ plus civil rights movement and the history of the 1960s and 70s that I've ever seen. And I'd like to talk about some of the people whose stories who that you have elevated in this film. And if we could, I'd love to start with Reverend Magora Kennedy. She is a lesbian. She's black and she's a woman. So she faced a triple threat, threat of discrimination. Uh, and she was raising five children on her own in the 1960s. Can, can you please tell us more about your interviews with her? Absolutely. Um, she is an example of a storyteller that we discovered through the archival footage research process. There was this groundbreaking panel actually the very first time that a group of out lesbians appeared on national television. Um, and these seven lesbians um, gathered together in 1971 to be part of the David Susskind show, which was this nationally syndicated uh, talk show hosted by David Susskind, who was, I think for his day, this pretty progressive, hip, liberal guy. Um, and so he was progressive enough to have a group of lesbians come on and talk about homosexuality disease or chosen lifestyle. I think that was the tagline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it kind of went downhill from there for, for, for poor David Susskind, because he was sort of spouting this rhetoric about the mental aberration that homosexuality represented. And, and he was, by doing that, he was really reflecting the, the social uh, belief, the widespread belief that psychiatrists and the medical establishment and really pretty much everyone in, in American society held to, uh, with few exceptions. And one of the women on that panel was Reverend Kennedy, who pushed back in such a feisty, fiery, passionate way. Um, and so when we saw that footage, we thought, could we possibly find her? Is she still alive? Where is she? And thankfully, her name, you know, if her name had been like Jane Jones, I really don't know if we could have found her. But Magora Kennedy... <laughs> was findable and, and through a search actually through the Stonewall Veterans uh, website, because yes, she was at Stonewall. Um, we, we did find her and we, we connected with her and it has been such a inspirational connection to, as you said, to connect with her and think about the intersectional activism over like six decades. And, you know, it's starting with this, choice that she faced when she was seven when she was 14 her mother discovered that she was interested in, in girls and, and and gave magora this choice she said you could either go to the mental institution in utica new york and attempt to get cured or you can get married and so she chose to get married at the age of 14 but i think that is one example of the sort of devastating impact of this label that that psychiatry 
automatically put on every single gay and lesbian person until the 70s. Like if you were gay, therefore you were automatically considered mentally ill. Yeah, and let's talk about Barbara Giddings and Kay LaHusen. Um, I actually have a personal connection because they traveled to Cleveland uh, for a fundraiser to support an LGBTQ plus organization that, that I and a group of people had just started back in 2001. And, and it was such an honor and a privilege to meet them both. Um, and can you just talk about your interviews with Kay? Yeah, it's been one of the the great pieces of this film is, is becoming friends with Kay. She's at a nursing home uh, in Pennsylvania, about an hour outside of Philadelphia. And I originally, she has not done too many interviews over the years. Uh, Barbara passed away, I think in 2006, and they were together more than four decades, living their lives together, but also activists together in this fight from the beginning. When I, one of the questions I asked Kay at some point is, you know, what was, how many other activists were there in Philadelphia at the time you got involved in the, in the early mid sixties? And she said, we were it, <laughs> so maybe barely exaggerating. We're talking about a handful of people who were willing to be out and step forward and, and fight for equality. And, you know, that feistiness is, is still with Kay. She's now 91 and, and she really provides a great voice in this film explaining the, the strategy and some of the decisions that went on behind the scenes. And notably, Kay was the one who came up with the idea to include a gay psychiatrist in this uh, infamous or famous panel from the 1972 APA annual meeting where Dr. Anonymous, John Fryer, the man in the mask, testifies about what it's like to be a gay psychiatrist. And he has to wear a mask uh, because he couldn't speak openly or he would have been fired. And so he, his voice uh, included, you know, Kay is the one who got the ball rolling on that. And one of the great things during the production is we actually discovered at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania an audio recording of Dr. Fryer's speech, which, you know, we knew there were handwritten notes from the speech, but to our mind, we didn't think there was an audio recording. And I'm not sure the Historical Society of Pennsylvania knew it either because there are 217 boxes of John Fryer's material. And I think Bennett was the one who discovered it in a, in a box of miscellaneous auto, audio recording. So it's been quite a, a great adventure to uncover the various archival pieces of this story. Uh, and then back, I had a, a quick question about your, just your uh, archive process of, of finding all of that information uh, because, you know, I feel like at this point I've seen everything and you were able to pull things that, uh, Andy came over last night and we watched both films back to back and I just I couldn't believe some of the stuff that you guys were able to uncover that uh, almost seemed uh, in a way very uh, hidden from the world. It's heartening to hear you say that. Yeah, I would say I have that and Patrick and our brilliant archival producers, Ritu Chandra and Luann Jones, um, have that sense that exactly as you said that you know we, there's sort of this body of material that gets sort of understandably recycled and re you know re um incorporated film after film and we really wanted to try to move beyond that and i guess for me i you know er, early on in my career i actually um worked on eyes on the prize and the very first i was thinking one of the very first tasks I had was going to Cleveland to try to find material on the election of Carl Stokes as the first black mayor in America. And I spent like two weeks at all these different historical societies and TV stations. And everyone said, oh, there was this famous debate, but it doesn't exist. And I found the damn thing. <laughs> I, found, I found the footage in like another film that had, or, you know, that was unlabeled. And, it, you know, it was just kind of this unexpected discovery. And I guess from that moment on, I, I, I have this sense that, you know, no doesn't always mean no. And the fact that something doesn't, isn't cataloged or isn't on the internet or isn't easy to find doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And just, you know, partly it did take Patrick and me five years to get this project <laughs> on. And as he said, like there were 217 boxes of Friars, Dr. Friars material and 
and like that 60 minutes piece, um, which is also amazing. Like 60 minutes did a, like a 20 minute segment in the um, summer of 1973 about the civil war that was going on within the psychiatric association. And that has not been seen since 1973, as far as I know. And it's just so rich and, and really like a, a, a milestone. So it's I ha I'm happy to hear you say that. And I, I am very proud of the team and the, the diligence and the perseverance that went into kind of unearthing a lot of the stuff that might otherwise have remained deeply buried. Yeah, hats off, hats off to to finding all of that stuff. And that mask was was frightening. It looked like Leatherface. I was <laughs> <laughs> well, one, of the, we yeah, one of the tidbits was that, you know, we the guy who cleaned out John Fryer's um, closet literally after he died <laughs> talked to us about finding the mask and deciding to toss it and throw it away yeah. um, which was a, mm. little, a little bit poignant but maybe there's a metaphor there and we do have the pictures that Kay Lahusen actually took those in, you know iconic pictures of the man in the mask at the APA convention so he does live on through those images as someone who's been watching LGBTQ plus history documentaries for decades, there were several epiphanies and surprises for me. I had no idea that the son of the notorious gay community opponent, Dr. Charles Saccharides, I had no idea that his son was gay. And I also had never really considered the notion that, that psychiatrists in the 1950s and 60s were not seeing happy men or women who were closeted or even out as clients. I mean, and, and no wonder so many of them agreed with the APA's classification uh, of homosexuality as an illness. So uh, I, I just wanna thank you for, for bringing that to light. Um, and I'm just curious of those, voice, of those voices who we have lost uh, throughout the last half century, uh, can you name like one or two people who you wish you could have interviewed on camera and why? Well, I guess for me, it probably would have been Dr. Fryer because, you know, there was a brief NPR interview and, and thankful, I mean, Frank Kameny passed away almost 10 years ago. Barbara's been gone. There have been a bunch of interviews with both of them. And so we did have that sort of to mine from, but John Fryer had just done a, a limited amount. So I think for me, it would have been great to be able to get inside his mind and really dive into exactly what he was thinking at that moment when he came out on that stage wearing this mask. I agree. Was, it's, you know, it's great that we do have his diary. At least there's some sense of like the, the both kind of the fear and the courage that he experienced through that moment where he says, you know, the next day I am still alive as he's writing on Allegheny Airlines. <laughs> I just love the, the texture of that of like the, just the whole experience, I don't know, yeah. But but I agree with Patrick, having access to him, reflecting on this would have been, and just how did people not discover who he was? Because <laughs> yes, yeah. it was a good, it was a great costume, but I I don't know, it's, it's amazing that he actually remained anonymous for a long time after that event. Uh, a, a little interesting small world uh, note, mm -hmm. um, one of my friends, is uh his dad is was dr spitzer and oh yeah and so uh you guys putting him in was was interesting and like just sort of knowing a backstory beyond dr spitzer that exists sort of in the in the public eye uh and just again small world yeah, he's a complicated man, and we, we would have liked yeah. to get into more about his background, but you know how it is on the cutting room floor. You just can't go in every direction. Yeah. Yeah. All right, All right. so next up, let's hear from you, Aaron and Andy, about your film, Yes, I Am, the Rick Weiland story. And Rick Weiland might be a name, a new name for some people because he did not speak, seek the spotlight. Uh, no. And I, I really appreciated the sentence that our synopsis writer, Amy Brown, wrote. She said, juxtaposed uh, to his quiet, reserved nature in the workplace was his colorful, unabashed 
social life as a proud gay man. So tell us what inspired you to make a film about Rick Wyland. Uh, you know, Patrick, it was one of those things. I mean, this film took uh, five years to make as well. And it was one of those things that um, the subject fell into my lap. And I really questioned at first, you know, could I tell this in an authentic and true way? Like, how do I connect to Rick? And, you know, having meetings with friends at first, but then really diving into um, what made Rick tick. And like, you know, we all have like this duality in our lives and we're all sort of like different people with different people. And uh, the more I found out about Rick, like the more I just felt connected to him. And um, the fact that he didn't want the spotlight and also being shy, elusive, and this sort of genius level brain, uh, but also being very out and proud in, in the seventies, like none of it on paper, like would make sense. Like you wouldn't be able to sort of draw the diagram because it's all over the place. Um, but, uh, diving into Rick's life was like cracking up in a cold case. Uh, he never gave any interviews. Um, I, I Andy and I spent countless hours trying to find something and we have, um, uh, a facility or archive here in Seattle called the Mohai. Um, and they had, they said, Oh, we have, you know, this box of his costumes and that he made. And there was this VHS tape and on that VHS tape, it's a boat cruise on in South Lake union in Seattle on a sunny day in the summer in like 1984 or five. And there he was, um, he doesn't talk to the camera, but you see him all dressed up uh, and you see it in the film. But I was able to find some childhood stuff uh, or childhood footage, but that's it. In terms of footage, that's all that exists. He Again, he never gave an interview. Um, so it, it, I throughout the process, it was interesting. And, you know, somebody who suffered from their um, wanting to be more uh, wanting to do more, uh, but was also shy, elusive. And I kind of had my own parallels with my own life uh, within that. And uh, um, finding Rick's diaries uh, was, I didn't even realize it at the time, but when I found his diaries, uh, which had been archived at Stanford, uh, I realized this is his voice and this is such a personal voice. And you know, um, Stanford, very gracious for them to allow me on their campus, like very, very much like um, if you're not a student, you can't be here. So I was able to get access to these amazing, amazing archives um, and then finding Rick's journals um, and then having them all digitized. Uh, he kept a daily journal since 1975 all the way up until his death. So bless Andy Volk for going in and helping me read them and other people and like pulling out just fragments of someone's, you know, personal life. It's like, you know, if someone were to read my diary, it's like, what would that be like? What would that sound like? And after talking to his friends and then uh, colleagues and, you know, I got to interview Bill Gates, which was amazing. And I got to almost interview Paul Allen, but he died two weeks before our interview. Um, so the everyone that's in the film, minus uh, In Inga Hansen, uh, who works at the Weiland Health Initiative at Stanford, knew Rick personally, and they all kind of have their own version of him. And I don't know, I think it just speaks to uh, the humanity behind behind all of us, especially queer people, of how we can how we have to adapt. And Rick was constantly adapting, and on paper he had everything, but. Uh, it just goes to show you that like mental health is real. And I also started my own mental health journey making this film. <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it's been a, a very amazing cathartic uh, experience. Andy, did you want to add anything to that? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I helped Aaron produce the film, but um, I didn't know who Rick was before Aaron started making the film. Um, and, you know, we're in Seattle, so you hear about Bill Gates, Microsoft, Paul Allen all the time. 
they both, you know, they have created the city in a sense. Um, but then Rick Wyland was just kind of not, not heard of. Um, and the amount of people that I've told who are my friends in the tech industry here um, about this film that we've been working on, they don't know who Rick Wyland is either. So um, the more Aaron told me about the story, the, the more just intrigued I was and in how inspiring, you know, what Rick was able to accomplish and how much of that has rippled throughout time. Um, and then as Aaron said too, uh, the, the journals, um, there were just endless journals um, across his life that we were able to read. And it's how much of that that I was able to connect with, um, just like this internal storm that was going on inside of him to try and figure out what to do with his life and how to be true to himself. Um, and I think Aaron's done an absolutely incredible job capturing Rick's spirit um, and the, the story itself, just what he's able to do, was able um, to have helped out with the creation of kind of this world that we all live in today. Um, yeah, it's just something that I'm, I'm very lucky to have been a part of. The access to those journals mm -hmm. had to be an, an extraordinary asset as you were shaping this documentary. And you, you tell a story about a person who struggled with severe clinical depression in a very unique way. So can you talk a little bit more about that and, 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 and how you address this topic in your, in your interviews with Mike Schaefer and other people close to him? Yeah. And it, the, I feel like there, there were so many ways in to this, to Rick's story. And, um, I, I, I talked to a few people that really wanted to straight wash his, uh, his story. And, I just really kept coming back to, you know, how, how would, if I were no longer here, how would I want someone to tell my story? And, um, that's how I approached it and, uh, dealing in with the topic of depression and suicide, uh, it's delicate and it's, you can exploit it in such an easy way, especially within film. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, to even, try to go down that path and you know people ask have have asked me like you know would why do you think rick took his own life and like i'm this film isn't trying to answer that question this film is just about a man who had joys suffered and he just so happened to you know help create some of, of the 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 biggest things that have impacted queer people and actually everyone on the planet uh and no one knows who he is so um i was always trying to treat it as though um it, it, i was always trying to treat it like i would just i'm like my story would i would want to have somebody tell my story um it was hard it was very hard to do um you know when you're making a documentary it's like i don't want to make it you know boring where it's like you know you tell half the audience you make a documentary and you lose them you lose half uh, and then you tell people you made a story about somebody who uh, helped start Microsoft and you lose like another half. So it's like, you're still making a movie at the same time. So it was just kind of like these puzzle pieces over time that kind of just crept together and it felt right. Uh, between uh, working with World of Wonder and uh, Zachary Quinto, who narr ended up narrating uh, his journals and having just like a solid team of people who believed in what I was doing and um, yeah, did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah. did great. And, and you know, to for many people, when you think of the founders of Microsoft, Rick's name doesn't come to the top of your head as, as we've already discussed, but the, the impact of his philanthropy is nothing short of extraordinary. And, and I really appreciated what you did towards the end of the film and showcasing all of the major contributions that he made uh, at critical times, like not, not just to keep these organizations doors open, but to help them thrive, you know, yep. in what yep. was then the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and, and what, you know, certainly AMFAR and, and so many other uh, important causes in the wake of the AIDS crisis. Um, 
I just I, can you expound on that a little bit in terms of how you made the film? Uh, it's it's staggering how much money he gave, especially as a queer person, when no one else was giving money to any organizations that early, uh, early, early AIDS and HIV research. Uh, act up, almost like uh, glad. All of these grassroots organizations who are now like these huge organizations. Rick played. I, I don't even know how to say like a paramount uh, role in in all of them and everyone owes a deep debt of gratitude towards Rick Wyland and how he set up his his philanthropy was thoughtful and it wasn't like here's a hundred thousand dollars and like good luck it was he wanted to see how that was going to cascade not for years but for decades to come and I mean all of us sitting here I mean we I think Mike Schaefer says like we owed it a, a, a deep debt of gratitude towards of to Rick and we do because he um, he loved to look at at himself as someone you know operating behind the scenes and like uh, I did an interview earlier today and someone asked me like why don't you think he wanted the limelight and I don't know I think he very much just enjoyed not being known for somebody who gave money but for someone who actually helped. Uh, progress, social progress, and helping fix social injustice. And it's like the more, I mean, I will be forever connected to him now as well, you know, as, as Andy. And I think that uh, his legacy just lives on. I mean, the essence of the film is, for me, has always been death is not the end. And um, so, yeah, uh, when I, I had invited Andy over last night, we watched two films back to back. And when I saw it was a uh, Taunt's uh, film, I was, I've been such a huge fan forever. So like even sitting here with Todd right now, it's like Gypsy 83 and uh, Edge of 17. It's like, it's, it was so, so cool. It's so cool to me to, to an honor to be here talking with them. Well, well, let me say that I am in the same space because this will be the the 23rd of the Cleveland International Film Festivals that, that, that I've worked on. And my first one was the uh, was in 1999 when we screened Edge of 17. And that was that was uh, really a, wow. a, a, a significant uh, screening for me. It made me love independent film and it made me love the Cleveland International Film Festival because as it turns out Todd and I grew up not too far away from each other and four years apart uh, in terms of graduating from high school. I grew up in Lorain County in Wellington of course he's from Sandusky and Todd is our 2021 Dreamcatcher Award recipient and and uh, you mentioned the the trilogy Edge of 17, Gypsy 83 and now Swan Song. So Todd, this is the question that I want to ask you most. Tell us the name of the Sandusky gay bar made famous by your films and help us understand uh, how that place shaped your coming out in Ohio back then. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. So the name of the gay bar was the Universal Fruit and Nut Company. And, best um, gay bar name ever, yeah, in my opinion. Best gay bar name ever, and actually best gay bar ever. It was um, right on Cleveland Road, like blazingly, uh, brazenly, I'm sorry, and blazingly. Um, <laughs> located right near the Cedar Point entrance. Like, um, it was uh, in this old cocktail, 50s mid-century modern cocktail lounge called the Surf Lounge. They had turned into the Fruit and Nut. And it was... It was um, the coolest place because it it was so diverse, you know, like a small town gay bar. It wasn't just men. It was men, women, straight, gay, old, older people, young people. I was like 17 when I snuck in there. Um, black, white, you know, like uh, it, it was like such an amazing melting pot of people that really did have a um, big influence on my life because I... I I feel like it saved my life, you know, growing up, not feeling like I belonged in my hometown, which was like pretty conservative. And I just felt kind of like an alien. And um, 
I I had seen this just to kind of loop it to. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say like I love I, I haven't seen you guys' films yet. I'm gonna watch them tonight. I love that you're making films about um, our gay elders and all that. There's so many stories, you know. There's so many stories that have to be told, and and I just I'm so excited to see the stories you guys told. Um, but I, I made a film about a gay elder too from my from my hometown um, when I was a little you know, closeted queer boy. Um, I would see this like fabulous man walk around downtown um, with a um, velvet fedora and like a feather boa and, you know, like this big, like, you know, those like upside down kind of glasses, you know, like, and, and with the monogram initials, you know, and she had like a long brown cigarette. And, um, and I was like, who the hell, what is that, you know? And um, I was really in a way kind of like fascinated and sort of scared because maybe I saw myself, you know, a bit, um, but I wasn't ready to confront it. But by the time I turned uh, 17 and got up the nerve to go to the Fruit and Nut Company, um, and I remember, I remember on the door there was a sign that said, the Universal Fruit and Nut Company is a gay establishment, but all are welcome, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that was the vibe of the place. And the first time that I went in there, um, <laughs> something was sparkling and shimmering on the dance floor. And I turned and there was this, this Pat, Mr. Pat, you know, the same guy that I had seen as a kid wearing like a, kind of like a J Judy, um, not Judy Garland, but um, Valley of the Doll, Susan Hayward had this like glittery sequin, like pantsuit is very famous. Um, and Pat was wearing something like that. You know, and um, I was just instantly in love and obsessed. And um, I never really, I only knew Pat fleetingly. Um, it wasn't long before I left there and moved off to New York, you know, after I graduated from high school. But I, I always, um, he made a big impact on me because like I, I, he really made me feel like it was okay to be not just gay, but like queer. You know, and um, and um, yeah. So I, I all these years, I, I I actually wrote the 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 inspiration for me writing the Edge of Seventeen screenplay was Mr. Pat, like Mr. Pat's story. And I, Mr. Pat, originally was like a huge um, the mentor character in the movie, which ultimately got cut out. We we um. We, we never even filmed it. During the shoot, we could not find somebody to play this guy because he was so unusual, you know, and so unique that we just literally couldn't find the right actor. So we wound up cutting out the character and um, that Leah Delaria is in the film and her, um, all of Pat's scenes became Leah's scenes. So we kind of like, like put those two um, characters together, which um, I mean, Leah is amazing and amazing in the film and everything worked out great. But at the time it was heartbreaking to me because like, I really wanted to um, pay homage to, you know, to this older gay elder, you know, that, that had such a big influence on me. But all, all of these years, I knew that when the time was right, I would sort of make up for it by making a film just all about Pat. And um, and that that's what that's what Swan Song is. Todd, can you, you talk? Meant? Sorry, I, I I gotta know about Udo Kier and just like how that how how that all landed, how it started. I mean, he's perfect. In my Thank opinion. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, it, like I said, I mean, <laughs> it was really uh, back in the day. It was hard to cast Pat, and even when we were doing this film, it was really hard to cast. Um, to the the um, the right actor, and um, I had talked to a number of actors, and I don't know, it just it just wasn't wasn't clicking. But um, one of my casting directors suggested Udo, and um, I immediately was like, "Oh my god, why didn't I think of that?" You know, and so I jumped on a plane and flew to Palm Springs where Udo lives, and it just you know we just really clicked. Um, He's he's a real he's a real character, you know, but he's also like um, really um, I mean, he's kind of become like family now, you know, like um, 
we had uh, we had a really intense, amazing time, and we we got to know each other before the shoot. Like it, I cast him like a year before we shot, so I had like visited him several times. He helped me very generously helped me do a Kickstarter campaign, which helped like raise money to get the movie going. And um, so Udo and I were like pretty good buddies by the time he rolled up in Sandusky to start shooting, you know, which which actually helped a lot, you know, and um, because we really like trusted each other. But but yeah, Udo is um, he's you know he's wonderful in in the film. I, I felt like I was uh, every day. I felt like I was witnessing like a master class in acting. You know, I thought too he was really subtle and understated. Like other mm -hmm. people might have brought like this over the top camp fabulousness, and he did bring fabulousness to the role. But it was in such a nuanced and subtle and authentic and like not at all trying too hard way which right. i was i mean i guess that's, that's obviously that's like he would bring that to any role but it was so perfect because i think that character could easily have shifted into a caricature or you know just kind of gone in other directions and it was such a fortuitous piece of, you know uh, um casting decision i think it was amazing Thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I agree. That's part of the reason why it was so hard to, to cast it, you know? And, you know, I mean, it's like, um, sometimes I feel like actors, both gay and straight, like playing a role like that, almost do like a put on, you know? Kind of right. like you're saying. It's like they're just trying too hard and like pushing it, forcing it, and it just feels false, you know? But- um, It's, it's but, being, it's, I think it's being, what I found in Udo was uh, funny, and heartbreaking at the same time, which I don't think is easy to do at all. And right. he did all of that. I mean, it's beautiful. It I laughed and it made me think about my own life and like how I carry myself in this world and what what's important to me. And those those opening scenes, Todd, I'm just was just like already like in almost in tears, like in the first like ten minutes of the film. So uh, he did such a brilliant job, and you did such a brilliant job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, I mean, I, I um, in, in a way, I really put myself into it because, like, I I haven't made a film in like more than ten years, you know. And so um, after my last film, I just didn't really know what to say next. And um, I think I also um, was a little burned from my second movie, Gypsy 83, which was a really personal story. And like, it just didn't like fly commercially. So I was sort of afraid to kind of put my heart, my true like heart back into, um, into my work because it's like, it sucks to be, rejected <laughs> you know what i mean and and um and you know i felt really i felt sort of devastated by that and um although the film went on to kind of be to find an audience but it just like never really it never really you know clicked like in terms of festivals um and stuff like that um but um never got into uh, a lot of festivals um but um yeah so like I think that like in a way I was putting myself into this character about, you know, it was uh, who, who had this thing that he loved, you know, like his, his, his hairstyling. And I always saw him as like a, like an artist with hair, you know, and, and, but that he had become um, because of sort of, you know, his damage, he had sort of like become disconnected from it. So in a way it, the, the script was me telling myself that I can do what I love again, you know? And so, so that, I'm gonna, sorry, Ted, I'm going to try to sneak one more question in before we need to wrap. Oh yeah. Sorry. I, I, I am very curious about what it was like making a film edge of 17 in the late 1990s in Sandusky, Ohio versus the late 2010s in Sandusky, Ohio. Can you talk about that? That's a great question. I mean, back when we made edge of 17, we literally created a fake script that what then took all the gay stuff out, you know, because, you know, we were afraid that people, when you shoot in a small town, you need a lot of help from the community. You need locations, extras, you know, shut down the streets, like all that kind of stuff. And we were, it was pretty homophobic back then. I'm not going to lie. I mean, Sandusky always had its like gay community, but at large, you know, the, the town at large, it was, um, 
it was pretty conservative. So it's almost like we went back in the closet, you know, I, to um, to make the film, which was like kind of sad. But um, but contrast that to you know landing there um, a couple summers ago when I first got there to start pre-production, the um, city was celebrating its third annual Gay Pride Festival, you know, which actually just like almost like blew my mind, you know, and um, and it's just you know the the everyone in town helped people put up the actors they gave free locations they you know everybody pitched in it, it, the city government gave us grants like it's like it was like open arms big giant hug from my hometown um and and that that was amazing and it really did show me in 20 years in a way it's a long time in that but in, on the other hand it's just a blip you know that in 20 years, like the attitude about about it completely changed from my hometown. So it's pretty fascinating. You're like the John Waters of Sandusky. <laughs> <laughs> I also right. think like seeing these three films together, there's this really amazing theme of authenticity that connects them. When you think about Pat and, mm -hmm. and Rick Wyland and the activists in Cured, like each of them really does embody the sense of, you know, pushing back against some really steep obstacles and, and, and finding the courage to be their authentic selves. You know, I don't know. There's, it's, I, it was fascinating to see these three or to think about these three films together and um, kudos to the film festival for grouping them and giving us a chance to yeah. talk together. Cause I, I, uh, yeah, I'm such a big fan of, of, of both of these films too. And really happy to have a chance to think about how they fit together. I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, share, if, if everybody doesn't know, uh, all our patrons, that while Swan Song is, the, is Todd's newest feature, uh, the first two of the trilogy, you can buy two for one. So you, you, you buy one ticket and you're able to see both. And we encourage everybody to see all three of Todd's films, Edge of 17, Gypsy 83, and Swan Song. We encourage, if you've not done so already, to see Cured and to see... Yes, I am the Rick Weiland story. We want to thank Patrick, Bennett, Aaron, Andy, and Todd for their time today. Uh, we would not be here without uh, your ongoing support to bring film home. So on behalf of the Cleveland International Film Festival, I'm going to ask that you please consider supporting our challenge match, which is presented by Cuyahoga Arts and Culture to support the future of the festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year, and we are grateful for any amount you're able to contribute to donate, to purchase tickets, or to check out the full schedule of filmmaker conversations. Please, please visit clevelandfilm.org. With that, please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time.